In as much as anyone cares about it, Son of Kong is a divisive film. Many see it as just a weak attempt to cash in on the success of the original 1933 King Kong. Others, while able to recognize its flaws, still see it as an enjoyable little movie in its own right. Nowhere near the scope and scale and grandeur of the original, but a charming enough epilogue to the story, wrapping up the dangling threads left behind by Kong's abrupt ending. And Darrow and Jack Driscoll have a happy ending, sure, but what about Carl Denham, who brought this destruction on New York and King Kong alike? The original plans were for a much more ambitious film than the one we ended up getting. As soon as it was apparent that King Kong was a smash hit, RKO executives wanted a sequel. By the end of March, before King Kong had even been released for nationwide distribution on April 7th, Son of Kong was a go, and Miriam C. Cooper promised them the moon. But he was quickly brought to Earth by two restrictions. The first was that the movie had to be out by Christmas, a peak movie-going season, and fast enough to cash in on the hype still circulating around King Kong. That was half the time it took to make the original. The second was that the budget was set in stone for $250,000, which was half the money that King Kong ended up spending. This was not a formula for a film to match the spectacle of King Kong, and it showed in the finished product. Son of Kong is a much smaller film, with far less reliance on special effects, and a plot so tight that it proceeds mainly by coincidence. Everyone is in just the right place at the right time, to avoid lengthy jungle treks or exposition. It might seem insane to follow up the biggest movie of all time with a film with half a budget and half production schedule, but we're used to bigger blowout sequels these days. In 1933, sequels in general were uncommon, and they weren't the surefire bet they are now. There are a few exceptions, like Tarzan and his mate or Bride of Frankenstein, where the sequel is as big, if not bigger, than the original. But then compare Dracula's Daughter to Dracula. It's a good film, but a clearly much more limited film. In reality, Son of Kong could have been two movies. The modern pattern of a standalone first movie and back-to-back -back sequels leading one into the other. The first sequel could have dealt with getting to the island, meeting Kiko, and finding the treasure. The latter focusing on the characters and destruction of the island, mixed throughout with more on Skull Island, its history, and its civilization. That is my own ambition, though. As it was, the actual plans for Son of Kong were full enough. The film we got was a kind of abbreviation of what Miriam C. Cooper, Ernest Shodzak, Ruth Rose, and Willis O'Brien originally intended. All the main story beats and basic ideas are there, but we were robbed by circumstance of the really big set pieces. The director's cut of Son of Kong would begin pretty much the same way the finished film did, with its sojourn in the Indonesian archipelago by way of Catalina Island, the murder, the stowaway, and the mutiny. Those were the easiest scenes to maintain, as they didn't involve much in the way of special effects. The big difference came with the Motley team's arrival on Skull Island. In the finished film, Denham and his crew of mutinies wash up on Skull Island's beach, where they are greeted and chased off by Noble Johnson's Grand Chief and a small contingent of warriors. They want no part of this crazy white man who brought Kong's wrath upon them and then kidnapped their god. As originally planned, they would have washed up on the beach to a desolate and destroyed village, plagued with dinosaurs strolling at will among the ruins. People often ask why there is a Kong-sized gate in the wall, or why Kong couldn't have just climbed the wall if he really wanted to. There's no answer to that in the movies, but I suspect that the wall was actually meant to keep out the dinosaurs. The ceremonies might not have been so much to appease Kong as to curry his favor so that he kept the dinosaurs under control. This original draft of Son of Kong doesn't say so, but it certainly implies as much, by ravenous dinosaurs plaguing the ruined village through the gaping hole now in the wall. In a common thread, much of Son of Kong was taken from unused ideas in Willis O'Brien's creation project. 
After 1925's The Lost World, Willis O'Brien's team and producer Harry Hoyt began work on a conceptual follow-up involving a crew of socialites rescued from a storm by a submarine, which in turn is stranded on an island that rose overnight during the storm. This mysterious island is weirdly teeming with life, a fully formed ecosystem of jungles and dinosaurs and even ruined temples, a new creation with the artifice of antiquity. After Cooper cancelled the creation project, many of the scenes and models were borrowed, or intended to be borrowed, for King Kong. But one of the scenes that wasn't was a confrontation between a Tyrannosaurus and a Stegosaurus in the ruins of a temple, a scene that would, in turn, go on to inspire two separate portions of Son of Kong. The first was the ruined village, home only to roving, ravenous dinosaurs. The second would come later. Denim and company trek through the jungle, happen across Kiko, the titular son of Kong, trapped in quicksand, and then reach the lost temple with its treasure. The temple would likewise have been inspired by creation. Unfortunately, the temple we did get was simply an altar in a cave, a missed opportunity to see the grandeur of Skull Island civilization at its peak. The next inspiration that Son of Kong would have taken from creation was the climax, which itself was borrowed from 1925's The Lost World. In The Lost World, a volcanic eruption ravages the Lost Plateau in South America, causing a dinosaur stampede. Like all the effects in Lost World, which is an excellent film in its own right, and not just as a prelude to King Kong, uh, this was still somewhat primitive. O'Brien wanted to give it another go with improved techniques, and worked that same island-destroying volcanic eruption and dinosaur stampede into creation. Now, that never materialized, and O'Brien got a chance to give it another go with Son of Kong. So yes, Son of Kong was originally going to end with an earthquake. It wasn't just a last-minute non-sequitur to give the film a dramatic finish. There was always meant to be a strong parallel between Denim being responsible for Kong's demise and Kiko being responsible for Denim's salvation, both material and spiritual. Kiko was Denim's absolution for his sins against Kiko's father. That this climax seems to just come out of nowhere is an artifact of how generally abbreviated Son of Kong became because of its half-budget and half-production schedule. In the original drafts, there would have been more foreshadowing that Skull Island was doomed by tremors. When the storm and earthquake hit, it would have caused a massive dinosaur stampede, a magnum opus for Willis O'Brien. Not that this ending wasn't a bit of an oversight anyway. They had to top King Kong, of course, which is an impossible task. But I would have left Skull Island alive, just in case you ever want to go back to it. As it was, Willis O'Brien did want to bring Kong back in the late 50s and early 60s, with his concept for King Kong vs. Frankenstein. Cooper had an alternate idea for sequels. Carl Denham, with his financial liability handled by Skull Island's treasure, was free to go on to explore the world and make trouble with other cryptid creatures. The abominable Carl Denham was an ill-fated project that would have sent Denham to the Himalayas on the trail of the Yeti. It would have been entertaining to see a film series of Carl Denham becoming a proto-Indiana Jones type of globetrotting explorer. Sure, none of the sequels would have reached the glory of King Kong, and there might have been diminishing returns with each installment, kind of like the Tarzan movies with Johnny Weissmuller, where from number three on they started getting so much worse that MGM sold off the entire series to RKO. Or, uh, I mean, there's the B-movie era of Universal Monsters. But, it would have been a fun series nonetheless. Instead, we did ultimately get a pair of conceptual sequels. Cooper went on to produce She in 1935, an adaptation of H. Ryder Haggard's 1887 novel, starring Western actor Randolph Scott and theater performer Helen Gehagen. The film boasted the redressed gates of Skull Island and a score by Max Steiner, set against gorgeous Art Deco sets. But it never really measured up to Kong. I mean, what could? She also had its budget slashed, which forced it to drop many things, including Technicolor. 
As a result, it lost money on its initial theatrical release. The second conceptual sequel was Mighty Joe Young, produced by Cooper, directed by Shodzak, written by Rose, with effects supervised by O'Brien. It's ironic that Cooper and O'Brien originally fought over how monstrous Cooper wanted Kong to be, because Mighty Joe Young goes to the other extreme of making its title monster an utterly jovial, friendly character. Nevertheless, had they been able to play their cards right with Son of Kong, they might have been able to make a better go of carrying on Kong's legacy. The Son of Kong that could have been was going to be a more ambitious film befitting its father. But, alas. As it is, though, it is still a charming little epilogue in its own right that ties up the dangling ends of King Kong very nicely. <laughs>